Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education, part 7, and this goes with notes in sessions 41 and 42. Now, we've been looking at this chart, you know, on Satan's works of darkness, and I told you at the end of the last session we were going to be turning to uh, the book of Isaiah, where it talks about the destruction that the Lord's Day will have upon these three categories of works of darkness. Um, but I want to say, I just want to take a second or two and talk about something very important right here. As sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, He does not expect us to be mindless drones. We're supposed to have an understanding of our Father's business. Not just, I don't know, I push this button and pull this lever and frabbits come out. I don't know anything about how it works. That doesn't, our Father's not glorified by that. And Satan's not intimidated by that. I don't want us to look at this like, just show me the button to push and the lever to pull. I, I really need us to understand it. Now I'm saying the same, I, this is the very thing I said to Monahan's right here too. So this is not the issue of learning the motions to go through. This is really being able to intelligently understand this is what my father is doing and I understand what the adversary is doing because part of the display that we're putting forth is our intelligence with regard to what's happening. Does that make sense? Okay. I just want to say that because th that means that every once in a while there's some background that we need to get to that you may be looking at and say, what, what does that have to do with, come on, come on, what does that have to do with it? And I appreciate the enthusiasm to come on, come on, but we have to do this with a full understanding of what's involved in this, okay? Nobody's giving me a hard time about this. I'm just saying it that way because I know there's a tendency to do that. Okay, now, having said that, um, I think I have a PowerPoint here. Give me this next one, Trent. I sure have. Yeah, here we go. Here's the basic backdrop for the prophets. Isaiah to Malachi, and that's all of them, are fifth course of punishment prophets. Everything in them pertains to the fifth course of punishment, beginning with its arrival at the captivity and running all the way to the end of the kingdom. That, 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 that's it. Now, I'm about to tell you something that, boy, if I had known this when I went off to Bible college, how well this would have served me. In fact, during my studies, I was saying twice, why didn't someone explain this to me? So, okay, Thomas, because he didn't know. All right, true enough. But now, I, I, but, uh, this would have been invaluable. Let me give you the second thing here as the background of the prophets. Isaiah through Malachi are composed of two groups. Gave them to you at the end of the last session. Isaiah to Zephaniah, Haggai to Malachi, and that depends on where they wrote. Yes? Uh, when they wrote. All right. Now, there's a third thing that I want to give you that I didn't give you at the end of the last session as a backdrop to the prophets, and here it is. There is structure and order to the prophets. Just as there is structure and order to Paul's epistles, Romans to Philemon, and there's a progression in the education, there is a progression in the prophets. And if you skip Isaiah and jump over into Ezekiel or Daniel, there are things that you'll need to know that will not become apparent to you. So I'm just... I'm just saying that. Now, that's not the thing that really was the killer for me. But now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a backdrop concerning. And by the way, this should be on your note taker. If you don't have your note taker out, this is what you're filling in. Back me up one, Trent. One slide. No, back me up. One. There you go, right there. Oh, one more. There you go. Isaiah through Malachi, our fifth course of punishment prophets. Did y'all get that filled in? Okay, it's on your note taker there. I just wanted you to have it because this is the salient points. Everything in them pertains to the fifth course of punishment, starting with its arrival and running all the way to the end of the kingdom. You should have a one-page front and back note taker.
Is that what it is? Page 29. Okay. Okay. Oh, you put the note taker in the notes? Well, thank you. Okay, well, see, I slept since then, Carolyn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm not used to that. Okay, very good. All right. Huh? It's in their notes. It's in their notes. If they don't have notes, then they should have a note taker. They don't have either? You don't have either? Do you? Okay, here you go. You do have it? Okay, okay. Good job. Bob doesn't have one. Here you go. You're welcome. Okay, everybody with me now? Isaiah through Malachi are fifth course of punishment prophets. Everything in them pertains to the fifth course of punishment, beginning with its arrival, which is the Babylonian captivity, and running all the way to the end of the kingdom. Here's the next one. Isaiah through Malachi are composed of two groups. Isaiah to Zephaniah. You saw this at the last time, but now this goes on your note taker. Haggai to Malachi, depending on when they wrote. The third basic issue, there is structure and order to the prophets. In other words, Isaiah is not just, you know, the starting point if you want to. It really needs to be the starting point. Yes? Uh-huh. I, I change it to the kingdom. It should be kingdom. It should be kingdom. Right. It should be kingdom. Um, here's, the next, um, here's the next issue, and that is the backdrop for Isaiah. All of the prophets concern themselves with seven major doctrinal issues. This is the thing I wish someone had told me about. When you get to the prophets... All of them are dealing with... Now, I'm not saying all of them talk about all seven. What I'm saying is there are seven major doctrinal issues and all of the prophets are addressing one or more or even all seven of those issues and that's all they're doing. So where I'm about to show you everything in the prophets in seven major doctrinal issues... So everything winds up into one of these categories. So let's do these pretty quickly. Number one, the first doctrinal issue is the details about the first installment of the fifth course of punishment. In other words, the captivity. So if they haven't yet gone into captivity and you got someone like Jeremiah or Isaiah that's warning them about it, they're certainly writing about the first installment. The others do too. They're writing about the, the first installment of the fifth course of punishment. That's the first major doctrinal issue. And it's a major doctrinal issue because once they go into that captivity, it's the point of no return. So it's a big deal. It's a big issue. Here's number two. The second doctrinal issue is the details about God's, and I'm just calling it His Jehovahness and grace. You could also call it the doctrine of the Messiah. And the reason I say that is because this is what God is going to do for Israel that she cannot do for herself for one of two areas. To deliver her from the predicament that she gets herself into, and to make her what she is supposed to be, a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. And God is going to have to do that for her. And that's what this second issue is about, that God will do it by His Godness, by His Jehovahness, and give it to them as a free gift of grace. They're not going to be able to produce this on their own. That, and, and, and that's why we say it's the doctrine of the Messiah, because in the, I don't have it on this board, but on your timeline where you have Redeemer, Deliverer, Avenger, King, and Blesser, that's what is going to be done for them to actually produce those things. Here's the third. Third doctrinal issue is the details of the new covenant. 
The new covenant is very closely connected to that second one that we just looked at. But it is such a big issue that it is treated as a separate doctrinal issue. But I'm not trying to separate it from what God is going to do through those mandates for Israel. The new covenant is for them, and it's going to make them what they're supposed to be. But this is of such significance that it's an issue in and of itself. The fourth, doctor, the fourth doctrinal issue is the details about the Lord's day of wrath in its two particular parts. Let me, when you get that written, I want to talk to you very briefly, 60 seconds, about those two parts. Here they are. As soon as the Lord's day of wrath comes to an end, before that kingdom gets itself started out here, the Lord is going to purge the apostate element out of Israel. That's the first of those two particular parts. The second one is, so, that's, so what you have is, you have apostate Israel being purged out of the nation. And you're going to find terminology back there about separating the wheat and the chaff. And then you've got another issue, and that is, God is going to avenge His cause with the Gentiles for Israel. So you've actually got two different things going on there. The apostate element of the nation and the Gentiles and the rest of the world. And God is going... And those, those are the two particular parts of the Lord's Day of Wrath. They're not the only parts, but they're the big ones. The fifth doctrinal issue is the details about... Oh, I just gave it to you. There it is. Purging the rebellious ones out of, the, out of Israel. And then you can give me that second one. And avenging wrath where he avenges his cause with Israel upon the Gentiles. So I, I gave you those. Okay. Were they on your note taker? Yes. Okay, but you got them. You need them again? All right, back up. Trent, back me up one. All right. So purging the rebellious ones out of the true Israel. Remember what Paul said? They are not all Israel who are of Israel. Remember that? Just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you're part of the true Israel. Okay, and now give me the second one. And he, and, and he avenges his cause with Israel upon the Gentiles. Sorry, I didn't think I had that in there. I didn't remember that I would made that part of the note taker. Uh, the details about the Lord's Day of Wrath in its two particular parts, yeah. Is everybody up with me now? Yeah. Sorry, I messed you up. My, my fault. The fifth doctrinal issue is the details about Israel's prescription for cleansing. You could also call this, this is not your note taker, you could also call this the doctrine of the remnant because the prescription for cleansing is the procedure that they must go through in order to become a part of the remnant of Israel. John is actually going to pick up on terminology from the Old Testament back there when he's baptized, I mean over there in the Gospels where he's baptizing at the River Jordan. It's part of Israel's prescription for cleansing. That shows up all through the prophets. Here's the sixth one. Six doctrinal issues, the details about the time schedule for the fifth course of punishment. You read Isaiah and you don't get any time schedule, but you sure wish you had one. And then along comes Jeremiah and he gives you the time schedule for the first installment, 70 years. And then you come along to Daniel and he gives you the whole rest of the time schedule. And so Daniel kind of then acts as the hub where all the other prophets keep coming into Daniel and back out because he's laid the whole time schedule out. They'll take a piece of that. They'll talk about something and apply it to a piece of that time schedule. So I'm just, it's not important that you know all that for now. It's just that the sixth issue is the time schedule for the entirety of the fifth course of punishment. And the seventh and final doctrinal issue is about the kingdom. How many verses do we have in there about the kingdom? We talk about, you know, the, the lion will lay down with the kid and the, you know, and, um, you know, a, a, a child will play and, 
uh, 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 you know, I, you know all that verse, you know. Okay, all right. Those are kingdom verse. That's the seventh doctrinal issue. Look, here's what I've just given you. I just gave you what all my time in college never gave me. You saved a bunch of money. Seven, huh? Yeah. The, 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 these seven, the, when you look at Isaiah and Malachi, you're talking about those seven things. And you ought to be able to read anything in there and go, this belongs with this. And then you get to the next chapter, you go, okay, this belongs with this. You know what that does? Yeah, you know what? Turn in a report on that next week. Okay, all right, just kidding. Yes, ma'am. What was it? it where it says to be Isaiah, is blank is the way down information. Isaiah's His methodology. methodology. Yeah, did we not do that? No. Give me the next, uh, here it is. It's just the next one. It's just the next one. We covered the seven, and now I'm coming back to number two for the backdrop to Isaiah. That's what that was. Isaiah's method, and, and, and look, this is important. Understand how the prophets are written. Isaiah's method is to lay down information and then come back and build on top of that, and then he'll lay down another bulk of information, and then he'll return back and add detail to that, and that will continue all the way through the book of Isaiah. So I'm going to give you an example of this. Isaiah chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The vision is singular. Not the visions. But so what Isaiah is going to get through a course of time is the separate parts of a single vision. So he's going to lay down the first part of the vision. And then he's going to kind of cycle through that. And then he's going to lay down the next part of the vision. And then he'll cycle through that. Then he'll lay down. Let me just show you. We'll jump to Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. When he says, I saw the Lord also, he wasn't saying, yeah, and, and I saw my uncle Ed and the Lord also. He's not talking about he saw more than one person. This is the saw also in addition to what he saw in chapter 1, verse 1. Are you with me? This is the next part of the single vision. So he says, I also, so here's what you know. From Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 1 to Isaiah chapter 5, that is the first bulk of information in the first part of the vision. Then you get to chapter 6, and then you're going to start a second part of the vision. And, bulk of, and it'll continue like that on through the book. So now let's, let's, let's turn to... Um, oh, well, I have a couple things to say there because here's what's going to happen. In these first five chapters, I, I think this is, I got to thinking about that and I thought, why, why are these things that we're going to find, find in these first five chapters? Because as I told you at the end of the last session, in Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 3, and Isaiah chapter 5, he's going to talk about judging these three categories of Satan's works of darkness. And you know, I think they're right up front because what you're getting is the Lord's attitude toward those works of darkness and why He's doing what He's doing in His day of wrath. That's going to highlight the importance of these works of darkness. And so, in these chapters, you're going to see a number of things, and that is, in this first five chapters, you're going to see that man is sinful, he's been in league with the adversary, you're going to see that he's been in opposition to God, he's been promoting and, and working right along with Satan's works of darkness, and, and so as we go through these, we're going, to, we're going to find some terminology. So Isaiah chapter 2, let's take a look, Isaiah chapter 2, and we're going to begin with verse 6. Therefore thou, Isaiah talking to the Lord, therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines 
and they please themselves and the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Here's what Isaiah is talking about. This is why God is about to judge you. And if there's some things written up here that make you think, what in the world is wrong with that? It's only because you don't yet possess a full understanding of what the works of darkness are producing. In other words, if you see their land is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. You might be saying, so, so they, they had a big army. What was wrong with that? By the way, it has nothing to do with the dispensation of grace. But it has to do with what with a mindset that Satan's works of darkness are producing in Israel, whereby they no longer need God. And I'm, just, I'm just saying it that way without going into the details of it. Forgive them not means Israel is going to get exactly what the Gentiles are going to get. And that wrath is going to be poured out on them as well. So now, as we get ready to read the part of the chapter we're really after, here's what I want you to do. There, is a, there are words all through what we're about to read that will fit into one of these three categories. I want you to see on your own if you can identify the category from the words that you're about to encounter. So here we go. We'll start, we'll start reading in verse 10, which is the next verse. Enter, by the way, when he says, all those things that you did, this is why the Lord is going gonna, is gonna to pour these judgments out. Then look what he says in verse 10. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Does that ring a bell with anybody about some other place in the Bible? Yeah. They'll hide themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountain. Remember that? Enter, this is, by the way, when you write that, and when he writes that, when John writes that in Revelation, this is going to be used twice in the book of Isaiah. This one and one in much more detail. That when you, if you had come through Isaiah and then read Revelation, you'd be thinking about these things sitting back here in Isaiah and going, oh, I know exactly what, what's going on with that. I know what God's do. I know what this judgment is designed to do. Okay, so enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. That's an important phrase. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. You've already identified the category, haven't you? See, that wasn't rocket science, was it? But let's keep reading it here. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan. John and I used to go back and forth about these terms. And you know what we're looking at here? When you're talking about all the cedars of Lebanon are high and lifted up, you're talking about the governmental rulers of Israel. And when you're talking about the oaks of Bashan, you're talking about the religious leaders of Israel. They were all high and lifted up. The, the pride of life category had worked in them to produce a particular way of thinking. We're going to encapsulate this on the board in just a minute. And upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted. That's the second time we've seen that phrase. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the, and the idols... He shall utterly abolish. Look at this. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord. Do you see that's that revelation thing again? And for the glory of His majesty. That's the second time that showed up. That was back in verse 10. We'll connect that in just a minute. When He ariseth to shake terribly. Now, don't change it yet, uh, Trent. When He ariseth to shake terribly. When He ariseth. Remember where he is? He's seated. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He ariseth 
to shake terribly the earth. Give me this next verse now. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. This is what, when you see that in Revelation, you should recall what's being said in Isaiah and go, oh, you know what? I know what they're doing. They're running for their lives. And those worthless idols, they're throwing those things away. To go, by the way, if this is pride of life, they've got those idols. We've seen these words, haughtiness, lofty looks, lifted up. All right, we'll talk about to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for, here it is again, the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. There it is again. Look, we've talked about this. When the Lord stands up, and that's what you should be thinking when Stephen says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father, and that's the signal at the end of that extension of mercy that Psalm 2 had come to pass, they had become the world of the ungodly, and God says, you know what, now, that's, this is it. I'm fixed to pour out my wrath without mixture. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted for? Okay, so let's come back and let's just kind of look at these real quickly. Back, uh, verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted. If it says the Lord alone shall be exalted, what do you think has been taking place? Yeah, men have been exalting themselves. In fact, they have been exalting one man in particular, and then in accordance with that, they have been exalting themselves. And so, all of these, I know it's not hard to look at that, and you go, oh, pride of life. But we're going to have opportunity to come back and look at some of these terms. That term of haughtiness and what's really in that term. Now let's take a look at this next verse, verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and up everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. You see, the Lord has taken those specific those specific categories, that, that one category and the things that are there, and now he's going to begin to judge those things so that men don't think about those things the way they used to. And so, verse 13. Uh, I don't have that. All right, let's just put it up there because it's in your note taker if it's not there. That's fine. Get, go ahead and give me, uh, get, give me that. There you go. The cedars of Lebanon, this is in your note taker. Israel's governmental leaders. And go ahead and give me that next one. The, uh, well, the Oaks of Bashan, they were supposed to be the religious leaders. I don't know why it didn't show up. Oh, there it is. Israel's religious leaders who are propagating her. And when you see that abbreviation, VRS, her vain religious system. And that's why James talks about that religion over there. He says, this man's religion is vain. Remember when he says that over there? So anyway, it, and that system, by the way, was working hand in glove with what Satan was doing in the world. That's why the Lord had to give that corrective doctrine when he got back over there. Okay, so let me see where I am here. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Uh, okay, so give me this next one, verse 14. And upon high, all the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, every high tower, every fence wall, upon all the ships of Tarsus, all pleasant pictures... And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down. The haughtiness of men shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. I'm just showing you those because all of these are going to be, all of these are going to be brought to a culmination. I want to fill something in for you. Um, go ahead and give me this next thing. On your chart. Oh, by the way, this is sort of a rhetorical phrase right here. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? That's almost a sarcastic statement. The, 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 the question is rhetorical. In other words, men have exalted themselves to the place that God is going to come along and say, Cease from men whose breath is in their nostrils. In other words, do you know how easy it is to snuff that out. They think they're so great. 
And this is the point. I know I mentioned it to you before, so I'll go ahead and say it here. There are things that are going on here which, wherein we recognize that because of that, that glory aspect that was mentioned three times in that verse that we talked about His glory and that they exalted you know, themselves. They are not only going to give God's glory to the Antichrist, but they are going to take it for themselves. And as we read in Genesis chapter 3, Satan will renew the agreement that he made with Adam and Eve back there. Ye shall be as gods. And that's where the pride of life is taking them out in the remaining portion of that night that they're going to exalt themselves. God says, I'm going to be the only one exalted. You're not going to take my glory and give it away. And so he's going to deal with that category. All right, now give me this next one. So here's what the way I've encapsulated it to put under here. I took all of those words and I encapsulated them in this phrase, prideful thinking. I realize that's not a big advancement for pride of life. But for right now, I just need to give you something that we can begin to use generically as we are going to go through these passages in a way that you'll begin to, to, to see it for what it is. We will come back and look at those terms. For instance, the lofty looks of man was in that passage. That's not just talking about someone looking like they're just superior to everybody with some kind of look on their face. That is really talking about how they view their future and their destiny. In other words, we're the ones that got ourselves to this point And we didn't need God to do that. And we're going to be the ones to take ourselves beyond this. This is where our destiny is. That's the kind of prideful thinking that's going on here. This is not just a guy that did a good job, you know, painting a room in his house. And you're saying God's going to judge him in the tribulation. This is a prideful thinking that takes the glory from God and gives it to men. It's a constant prideful thinking. It, it, it's in, it permeates everything about them. And so I just want you to see that, that this, first, this first issue is really the issue at the end, the issue of deity. Let me just give you a verse to go along with that. This is Romans 1.21. Because that when they knew God... They glorified him not as God. The reason I'm picking that up is because twice in that passage, if not three times, it talked about his glory being at issue with them. In other words, they were looking at God and acting like, you're not God. We, we repudiate you. But here's, this guy is God. And remember Jesus, I think I've got this next, that Jesus talked about this in John chapter 5. I am, come, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you shall receive. And that's exactly what was going to happen. That when, when, when Satan's man showed up, or will show up, uh, he will be accepted of them. And so, here's what's happening. I think you should have this kind of on your chart somewhere I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where it is but there is a set of arrows that goes kind of like this do you see that on your chart all right here here's what we have on this side we have godliness and on this side we have satanliness i know that's not a word but i'm going to use it And here's the thing that takes men from godliness to Satanliness. Man's increasing pride. And the the pride of life category of works of darkness are moving men from godliness to to Satanliness, which means they're going to be thinking like Satan thinks. They'll be doing things his way and laboring with him. Now let's move to Isaiah chapter 3, and let's see the next category of the works of darkness. 
And again, we need to be looking at the thing. Now, can I just warn you here? When I went through this and I read chapter 3, I thought I identified this with one of these remaining two categories. And then when I got to chapter 5, I realized I had misidentified it and I had to go back. Because something I'd been taught way back there about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, didn't really match what the Scripture was saying. So I looked at that wrong. So I'm just warning you about that. So Isaiah, read chapter 5, but who knew that? <laughs> okay, Isaiah chapter 3. Again, we'll start you here in verse 9. The shoe of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. By the way, that, that first phrase is instructive because these people are not ashamed of what they're doing. They're flaunting what they're doing. That's why he's making the comparison here. What the, the category left here is about an area where they're saying, this is what we're doing, and we're wearing it like a badge of honor. All right. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. For as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord, here it is again, standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. You see this issue back there? Okay. And, and the Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For you have eaten up the vineyard and the, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye that you beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. It, again, just like in chapter 2 here with that prideful thinking, God starts out having the prophet show why they deserve what he's about to say is going to happen to them. Now, we'll take this up, excuse me, in the next verse, 16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. Now, he's going to take this pride issue, and now he's going to move it into another category. By the way, the reason he's using the daughters of Zion is because at that time, they are the epitome of what the works of darkness are producing in Israel. And when he says that, everyone knows what he's talking about. So I'm, I'm just saying it that way because this is, this is who he's using to illustrate what he's after. Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Now you can go on and read the rest of the chapter on your own about the daughters of Zion, but there's something that's already been mentioned now that we're going to fill in right here that will take you to another, in fact, I pointed it out, didn't I? It's the lust of the eyes, because at first I thought this was lust of the flesh. That's not what this is. This is the lust of the eyes, and here's the word we're going to write. In fact, give it to, I may have it on the deal. Give me the next slide, wantonness. And by the way, when, and you say, well, how do you know that's lust of the eyes and not lust of the flesh? How did you come to that? Well, I didn't come to it until I actually got to the lust of the flesh and realized why, am I why is this duplicating here? I, and then I thought, well, you know, what's going on? But back me up, Trent, to this passage that we just looked at. With stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. All of those words are important. He is talking about a lust of the eyes, and here we're going to talk about wantonness. And let me tell you what that is in a nutshell. Wantonness is what they are engaging in. And by the way, when he, I'll say it this way. And when he says, and the Lord will discover their secret parts, is because that's the thing that they are using the most that the Lord says, fine, if you want to 
if you want to pervert yourselves in that way, I'm trying to do this with some degree of decorum here. You understand this is mostly sexual in nature. But if you're going to deviate yourself in that way, then you know what? My judgments are going to be right in line with that. Wantonness is the idea that, and, th and by the way, this isn't just, just wantonness, but this is a great wantonness that actually pushes the boundaries of what is out of bounds. It pushes those boundaries further and further and further until finally there is absolutely no act that a person can perform that is considered to be out of bounds or wrong or unnatural or any of those things. Everything is now acceptable. And, th and th well, you, you, you say that, but before we're through, you're going to understand we're not there yet. We're not there yet. This is going to go... This is going to go well beyond. Can I say it this way again? I'm trying to use some decorum. This is going beyond the things that you're looking at now. This is going to go beyond gender and species. To where those things will become the norm. And, and when these things happen... Out here, the normal relationships will be viewed as evil. And these others will be touted as smart and progressive and forward-thinking and inclusive and open-minded and hip and cool, and every other word that makes them appealing, and then, and then those on the outside of that are going to be looked at as dangerous and narrow-minded and bigoted. And, 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 here, and I know you're looking at things, but look, let me just say it this way. This is going to go far beyond anything that you see going on now to where there is nothing considered out of bounds. We have things that, ha, look, there is a crime that if a man goes to prison for it and the other prisoners find out, even they will not tolerate that. You may or may not include in what I'm talking about, there is coming a day when those things will become acceptable in society. There is coming a day when there will be nothing that men can imagine to do that, men, that, that, that the world at large will not put their stamp of approval on and woe unto you if you oppose it. I'm talking about this is going way out there. And you understand, this is going to happen in process, Bob. You heard yesterday we were talking, they were talking about possibility of marrying animals. Bestiality is and part of what this is about. The owners of pets will no longer be called owners, but the, parents. They're called pet parents. Pet parents. Yeah. Pet parents. You, you, don't own an, you don't own your dog. That's slavery. You know what that is? That is moving animals to the position of humans. And then you take humans and move them to the position of deity. So you have this one doing that, and now you have men saying, whatever I can imagine to do, and this is what wantonness does. It removes the word perverse from the dictionary. There, there is nothing. This is where the works of darkness in this category are moving the world. This ought to make you want to cast off the works of darkness.
and you realize that as a member of the believing remnant out here in the remaining portion of that night, they're going to be living right in the smack dab middle of it. And do you know how much pressure there is going to be to back off of your stand? How much pressure there is going to be to dim that light? Because that's really what the policy is not only going to do to them there, it's what he's going to do to you and me here. He is going to ask us to take a look at the most heinous things that men have ever imagined to do. And he is going to ask us not only to come to terms with them, but to embrace it and participate. This is, this is the, 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 Satan's works of darkness. They're on their way. They're not nearly where they're going to be. All right, now, having said that, I see we're right here at out of time. So here's what I'm going to do. You already know that if this was Isaiah 2, and this was Isaiah 3, that this has got to be Isaiah 5. So until I come back in two weeks, you might want to go over to Isaiah chapter 5 and start reading, because now you're going to see the lust of the flesh. And I am going to use, by the way, by the way, I just, I just, I just can't, this all is so connected. This is so, I, I want to say it's so great. This, this, the study of it is so great. What is portraying is, of course, evil. But look, the word that we're going to use for this over here is, again, going to be summing up all of the things that we see in this chapter. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to verse 14 because in ver I don't have it. I don't have it in my notes, but would you just turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 13? And I want, to, I want you to be looking at this verse when I give this to you, because we're going to be adding these to our chart when we come back next time. And not only that, we're going to move in the Bible to another place, and then we're going to start adding, because now we're just kind of summing them up. At, when we come back the next time, we're going to start putting individual works of darkness in lists down through here. Not important for us to identify them all. By the way, there's a bunch of them. But I need us to be able to see them individually clearly so that when you're looking at them in the Word, you can go, okay, that's this one or that's this one. And why is that important? Because depending on which one you're casting off is going to determine what kind of armor you need for Satan's retaliation. So this is all, I mean, when you see the precision of all of this, this is an amazing thing. Here's what I'm thinking, Tommy. How come nobody told us about this? If I could have grown up, if I could have grown up in a church that had been teaching this from the time I was a kid, we could already be casting off the works of darkness. You got a question? His ability to cover that up has been extremely successful. But that is not, that has not been, that's a good question. She's saying, you know, the church has been ignorant of this. Isn't that the enemy, you know, covering that up? She's exactly right. But he's not using the works of darkness to do that. He's using a very general policy of evil that is at work against everybody in general. In other words, there's a general policy of evil out there to keep people from being saved. Once they are saved, there's a general policy of evil out there to keep them from understanding what he's really doing so that they never really know about the works of darkness and they don't know how to cast them off. There's a very general policy of evil out there that keeps people from understanding how to rightly divide the word. There's a real general policy of evil out there to keep people from knowing the difference between God's program with Israel and his program with the church, the body of Christ. There's a general policy policy of evil and it's at work all the time and so she's right those are happening and he doesn't need th this is what's driving the world he is perfectly content for a church to meet every Sunday to run 5,000 in attendance to have a huge TV ministry and it totally unaffects his works of darkness and he is tickled to death for them to just pat themselves on the back and talk about what a great job they're doing because he is completely unaffected by that see in the old days that's how i define things 
You had to be able to affect thousands of people. But what with? So it's just important. Okay, so what was I about to show you now? Thank you. There you go. Last thing we'll do. And then we're out of time because it's 9 o'clock on the button, so we'll be done. Look at verse 13. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in, and here are these three pairs, rioting and drunkenness, chambering. Somebody came to me and said, may have been here, I can't remember. They said, I've got an Oxford English Dictionary at home, and I looked up chambering, and I couldn't find it. Was that you, Sue? That was you? Okay. It just so happens, I'm not bragging, somebody gave it to me. I have an unabridged Oxford English Dictionary, and it has chambering. Now, if you just look it up in a normal dictionary, you know, you can't have every word in a volume this thick, you know. So they're choosing. Chambering is a word, you may have never heard it used in the normal conversation in your life chambering and wantonness and the last one is strife the last pair strife and envying now I'm going to tell you two things number one there are three pairs because each of these pairs belongs in a separate category <laughs> and that's the reason we use this term, because I wanted you to be able to come down here and realize these are lust of the eyes. Now, by the way, okay, now you're starting to do this. We're going to add these to the list next week. But what I want you to see is these three, and by the way, the same thing I was going to say, there's a reason two of them, they're given to you in pairs, Think about that, and I'll get your answer next time. Why are they impaired? Why didn't he just give us one in each one, or give us two and one, and three of another, and one of another? Why, do you do, why is it pairs? That's important. So there's something about that, huh? Yeah, that's what, just, just think about that, okay. By the way, the other thing about these is, these three are the very first works of darkness that will be used against you and I when we cast off one of these categories up here. Now, I know you may be looking at it going, wait, wait a minute. Rioting and drunkenness is going to be used against us? Yes. When he says cast off, does that mean, does that mean that we're going to cast it away from us? No, us, no. We're going to affect the work of those works of darkness in the world. We're going to cast off their ability to produce what they're producing. Yes. We're going to cast off their ability to produce the world of the ungodly. Now you realize this was written to the churches. Every church was supposed to be engaging in this. So, as Bob and I discussed earlier how many people are casting off the works of darkness? How, how much impact is being made? Well, you know what? That's the success of the policy of evil. Folks, this is the... You want to talk about spiritual warfare? There's one thing that impacts his works of darkness, and that's to understand how to cast them off according to Romans 13. Everything else is playing games at it. Everything else is going through the motions. And say whatever you want to say. Paul told you to do this. This is what he told you to do. We're going to learn to do that. Okay. When Lincoln gets up there, the good news club, and teaches the Bible story. Yes. And he gives the little children a chance to be saved. Yes. Isn't that testing off the fortune of the No. It's not? No. Even though when you're uh, telling that little child, make choices, good choices, da 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 da. No. No, because casting off, well, no. That's a fair question. Let me ask that question a different way. Is that doing anything? Indeed it is. It's not casting off the works of darkness. 
We've had plenty of churches that have people come down the aisle and profess Christ, and, and they get them in a new member's class, and they start to teach them things about the Bible. No works of darkness have been cast off in that process. We are. Because those activities have to do specifically with the individual things that we're going to start listing in these categories. But when you stand up in a good news club and you give kids a chance to trust Christ as their Savior and, and you're trying to teach them things about how to live, does that mean anything in this world? Indeed it does. Because that is the light of God consciousness. And hopefully you want it to go, and I know you guys do, but you want that to go somewhere even beyond that. But the light of God consciousness means something in this world. When you see what the pride of life category is after, you will understand that when that category, remember I told you these are all after something individually different. When you see what this is after, when he is successful in this category, everything that we know about church and serving the Lord and all of that kind of business will be gone. It will be gone. And so will this dispensation of grace. So, and we'll do that. We'll discover what these categories are after. But what I need to do first is show you the things that are sitting in these categories and how to identify them. So I wanted you to see these verses. Look, go back to Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 3 and read these over. And, and let me end with this last thing because this is fixing to go off. Does it not seem significant to you as it did to me that in the very first part of Isaiah's vision, the first major thing that he does is talk about what the Lord is going to destroy in his day of wrath. And see, and these are things that we don't normally think of that way. And the Lord is saying, these are the things that are, they're propelling everything. And God says, I hate them. Okay, let's have a prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and thank you for your word that informs us of all the things that we need to understand. We pray for its effectual work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, love you guys. See you next time.